This evening we're going to be doing chapter 7 of the Vimalar Kirti Nirdasha Sutra. And this is one translation of it is regarding living beings. And why don't you go ahead, please? And the background and important points are the ones I use over and over again because people forget from one period to the next. Uh, the Vimalakirti Sutra focuses on a lay person who has exceeded the spiritual powers of almost all of Shakyamuni Buddha's disciples and bodhisattvas. And he is pretending to be sick in bed to attract an audience of visitors who have come to wish him well and inquire about his health. This is the way it starts. And the sutra reaches its climax when Vimala Kirti asks his audience of bodhisattvas to describe the nature of non-duality. Next, please. Some important points about the sutra as a whole. The first is that awakening does not depend upon ordination. Now, to put this into context, remember that in the Nikaya, it was practice that only those who had been ordained would reach awakening. And so this sutra is stating emphatically that in fact that's not the case, that anyone can be awakened. And that was that was part of the movement toward the Mahayana, away from uh, just ordained folks attaining awakening. The second is it introduces the idea of upaya, skillful means. Uh, and specifically to teach the nirvana and samsara are at an ultimate level not different. And the final point that, that, that I think is important for folks here is that he asserts that a bodhisattva, and here we're speaking of not heavenly bodhisattvas, we're talking about human bodhisattvas. And for people who might find that a little confusing, you really have those bodhisattvas which are heavenly bodhisattvas like Avalokitesvara and Manjushri, etc. But then you have individuals who are bodhisattvas who are on the Buddhist path. And so here he's speaking specifically about bodhisattvas who are living in the world, um, human beings and engaging um, in the world. And the point that he's making is that you can engage fully even to the point of partaking of its pleasures, passions, and defilements while without being attached to them and constrained by them or corrupted by them. This was really, those three points were a big deal when the sutra was written um, in somewhere in the second century uh, BCE, or uh, CE, I should say. Next, please. And so we're going to go with the narrative thus far. Uh, we're, remember, we're on chapter seven. Burton Watkins, uh, excuse me, Wat Watson argues that the doctrine of emptiness is a central teaching of the sutra, along with the related idea that since all dharmas are of the same nature, they are non-dual, having a single ultimate quality. The Vimukirti Sutra is one of the oldest Mahayana sutras and contains the Majamaka philosophy of emptiness, shunyata, as a foundational element that may have served as a foundation for Nagarjuna's school. The story thus far. Shakyamuni has asked his disciple and bodhisattvas to visit the noble layperson Vimala Kirti to inquire about his illness. And all have declined because they claim Vimala Kirti has humbled them in the past, demonstrating his superior knowledge of the teachings and practices, except for Manjushri, the bodhisattva of wisdom. Even Manjushri feels humbled by Vimala Kirti, but he agrees to go and visit the, lay, the layman. Then, a host of disciples, Buddhas, Bodhisattvas, gods, and goddesses decide to go along to witness because of a conversation between Vimala Kirti and Manjushri would be immeasurably illuminating. Also, I suspect they would find it an entertaining debate and just want to see Manjushri smack down. But that's, that's my surmise. You will recall that at the end of chapter 5, Manjushri arrives at Vimala Kirti's house and is shown to a bare room with only a single cot, with Vimala Kirti lying in it. The room was small with dozens of disciples and thousands of bodhisattvas and heavenly beings crammed into the space. Room, we're talking about something the size of a closet. Um, 
Vimalakirti goes on to eloquently explain the basics of Buddhist teachings to the assembled. Um, and here I think that, that uh, Doctor Who, the idea of Doctor Who's TARDIS, was undoubtedly taken. Yeah, and Vimalakirti performs a further miracle, summoning from another distant Buddha field 32,000 vast lion thrones for Manjushri and his company without expanding his narrow room. This space and mind-bending miracle is taken as the chance to teach that a vast array of unthinkable things are possible for advanced adherents of the Mahayana, inhaling all the winds of the world at once and showing all the offerings ever given to all the Buddhas in a single pore of the skin of their bodies. From the previous chapter six, we see that most of us know that perception offers an infinitely graduated continuum of experience. However, language is frequently reduced to two antonyms for each feature. Language more or less forces us into this binary process. Even in our digital world, because of our modern quantitative science, we use zero and one and have recovered the old linguistic comfort of binariness, as one scientist noted. In realizing emptiness or a boundless state of heart and mind, the duality of non-duality itself is transcended, for neither duality nor non-duality exist in and of themselves, and yet this does not mean by passing suffering, looking at the example of Emil Kirti and his sickness. Ah, not one, not two, which brings us to chapter seven. Next, please. <clears throat> and we start out the narrative in chapter 7, thusly. Therefore, Manjushri, the crown prince, addressed Vimalakirti, Good sir, how should a bodhisattva regard all living beings? Vimalakirti replied, Manjushri, a bodhisattva should regard all living beings as a wise man regards a reflection of the moon in water or as a magician regard men created by magic. He should regard them as being like a face in a mirror, like the water of a mirage, like the sound of an echo, like the mass of clouds in the sky, like the previous moment of a ball of foam, like the appearance and disappearance of a bubble of water, like the core of a plantain tree, like a flash of lightning, like the fifth gray element, like the seventh sense medium, like the appearance of matter in an immaterial realm, like a sprout from a rotten seed, like a tortoise hair coat, like the fun of games or, or one who wishes to die, like the egoistic views of a stream winner, like a third rebirth of a once returner, like the descent of a non-returner into a womb, like the existence of desire, hatred, and folly in a saint, like thoughts of avarice, immorality, wickedness, and hostility in a bodhisattva who has attained tolerance, like the instincts of passion in a Tathagata, like the perception of color in one blind from birth, like the inhalation of exhalation of an ascetic absorbed by the meditation of cessation, like the track of a bird in the sky, like the erection of a eunuch, like the pregnancy of a barren woman, like the unproduced passions of an emanated incarnation of the Tathagata, like dream vision seen after waking, like the passions of one who is free of conceptualizations, like fire burning without fuel, like the reincarnation of one was attained ultimate liberation. Now, I went on like that because I just find it really fascinating. <laughs> I find that whole string so of things to be really fascinating. And Watson footnotes that this section by writing that each of the examples is one more of each category than actually exists. That's the point of it. In other words, how does a bodhisattva view um, sentient beings? views it as something more than just viewing the, the suffering of sentient beings. There's something more to it. That's the point. And my interpretation of that is that it implies that the bodhisattva regard or observation goes beyond our conventional notions, beyond our consideration of the potential found in each. In other words, the bodhisattva is not content to rely on perception only as is written a little later regarding this section about the bodhisattva. He treats them with a compassion that never despairs, seeing that all is empty without ego, treats them with compassion of bestowal of the law, never stinting in his gifts. So that's 
where we are at this point. Next, please. And I'm going to take us on a slight tangent here um, because one of the most um, exceptional um, of Japanese historical characters is Prince Shotoku. And he wrote the expository commentary on the Vimla Kirti Sutra, which I haven't mentioned before. But here I'd like to introduce this, this work and a prince attributed to Prince Jogu, uh, who is Prince uh, uh, Shotoku from uh, 574 to 622 CE. And he rules as a region of, region of Japan and is one of the most celebrated figures in all of Japanese history. And the purported founder of Buddhism in Japan, you'll recall the Prince Shotoku, as he is best known, along with Emperor Yomi and Empress Suiko, are considered to be responsible for promulgating Buddhism in Japan in the 6th century. This was one of the three commentaries that are attributed to the, to the prince, and the other two being a commentary on the Lotus Sutra and the Shermila Devi Sutra. And his attributed commentary on the sutra demonstrates it's important in East Asian Buddhism. In other words, and, and I'm, I'm not going to go into this in, in great detail, there is a question as to whether or not Prince Shotoku actually wrote the commentaries, or were they attributed to him to give them more importance. But the point being, there's only three commentaries that, he, that are attributed to him, the Lotus Sutra, Shimala Devi, and the uh, Vimala Kirti. That demonstrates how important this sutra was from the beginning of Buddhism being introduced into Japan. Um, in, in this and several other chapters, he makes reference to people, of, I, I should say Prince Shotoku in his commentary, makes reference to people of middling capacity. And this is a reference to Shravakas and by extension those who have not embraced the Bodhisattva path. He maintains that four doubts arise from about hearing the love that bodhisattvas have for sentient beings. And we have the four doubts that are listed here. Um, the use of a paya skillful means for the sake of sentient beings. Upaya was really a Mahayana, not invention. We find it listed in Nikaya uh, canon. On the other hand, it didn't really have much, it didn't gain much traction, put it that way. And second doubt is how can they transform meaning uh, how can bodhisattvas transform sentient beings being impartially? In other words, how can they, how can the bodhisattva not have partiality? How can he not favor one over another, so to speak? Bodhisattvas contemplate the, the impermanence and remain in samsara, serenely accepting dukkha to save sentient beings. This is a direct reference to Nikaya Buddhism in which one would seek awake that the very definition of awakening is the um, dissolving of the self and not returning to the samsaric world and then fourth that the bodhisattva can learn many and various practices of the middle way um, from the from the nikaya perspective those of middle incapacity in other words um, that would not be practical because there was only one set of practices, not many practices. He then goes on about unpacking each of the points made in the chapter addressing these, these four doubts. The commentary explores the middle way between the provisional realm and our everyday perceived existence and the perception of the bodhisattva, a perception free from attachment, something to which we should strive for in our journey toward liberation. Keep this in mind as I approach one of the more sensational and perhaps easily misunderstood elements of the chapter. Next, please. So I, this is a relatively long chapter, and so um, I don't want to go, I, it would take too long to discuss the entire chapter in the time that we have. So I'm just choosing uh, several to focus on. Um, and the one that I want to focus on is often what people see and comment on. And it starts out, Chariputra said, why don't you change out of this female body? This is a goddess who appears in Vimala Kirti's room. And the goddess replied, for the past 12 years, I've been trying to take on female form, but in the end with no success. 
What is there to change if a sorcerer were to conjure up a phantom woman and then someone asked her why she didn't change out of her female body? Would that be any kind of reasonable question? Shariputra says, no, such a woman would not really exist. So what would there be to transform? Hold on a second here. The goddess said, just so, Reverend Shariputra, all things do not really exist. Now, would you think, quote, what prevents one whose nature is that of a magical incarnation from transforming herself out of her female state, unquote? Thereupon, the goddess employed her magical power to cause the elder, Shariputra, to appear in her form and to cause herself to appear in his form. In other words, she becomes a male and he becomes a female. Then the goddess is transformed into Shariputra, said to Shariputra, transformed into a, god, into a goddess. Reverend Shariputra, what prevents you from transforming yourself out of your female state? And Shariputra, transformed into the goddess, replied, quote, I no longer appear in the form of a male. My body has changed in the body of a woman. I do not know what to transform, unquote. The goddess continued, if the elder could, change, could again change out of the female state, then all women could also change out of their female states. All women appear in the form of women is in just the same way as the elder appears in the form of woman. While they are not women in reality, they appear in the form of woman. With this in mind, the Buddha said, in all things, there is neither male nor female. Then the goddess released her magical power and each returned to his ordinary form. He then said to him, Reverend Shariputra, what have you done with your female form? Shariputra, I neither made it nor did I change it. Goddess, so all things are neither made nor changed, and that they are not made and not changed. That is the teaching of the Buddha. And we might read this. Now that's that's the end of the quote from the, from the chapter. We might read this in relation to our contemporary understanding of gender fluidity, and that would be convenient and affirm many of our current notions about gender. However, we have to keep in mind that Buddhist teachings contend that sexual identity is a feature of the provisional world. Um, can we go on to the next, please? Next, yeah. <clears throat> Forgot to let you know. I really like that statue. <laughs> um, anyway, we have to keep in mind that Buddhist teachings contend that sexual identity is a feature of the provisional world, that Buddhists specifically are beyond the provisional and appear not as binary sexual beings, but as projections that we have from the provisional. In other words, when we look at a statue of Buddha, let's say Yakshin Yorai, which is in, in our, our Hondo, it's in a male form, but that's just our projection of the Buddhas of the Buddha families. The Buddhas, in fact, according to Buddhist tradition, are beyond gender because gender is some uh, sexual, uh, sexual identity. I shouldn't say gender, but sexual identity is part of the provisional world, but not part of the absolute. In the absolute, there are no binaries. So you would not have a male and a female. And so what we see when we when we look at Yakshin Yorai as that statue is created as a male, we could just as easily make as a female, and it would not be incorrect. Although to make it more or less male or female would be more correct as opposed to making it one or the other. Heavenly bodhisattvas, by comparison, do take on sexual identity as upaya to facilitate the liberation of sentient beings, not as a statement of binary sexuality. And we see how this works, for instance, with Avalokitesvara. Avalokitesvara in Tibetan Buddhism and in early Buddhism, early Mahayana Buddhism, started out as a male, but in China becomes a female over time. Why did that occur? And, and, and there are many treatises written about this very subject, but it really comes down to the qualities of Avalokitesvara <clears throat> seem to be more feminine than masculine. And so East Asian Buddhism 
wanted to represent Pablo Kitsavara as female as opposed to male. And again, more relatable? Is that and, and more relatable in that sense. Yeah, that's a good point. You and Bodhisattva should be aware that the binary existence we have is a product of reproduction. But as individuals accept, as individuals, we should accept the fluidity that gender implies. When, when this sutra was composed, women were delegated to an inferior position within most societies. And the wonder that Shariputra had at the appearance of the goddess was a statement of his attachment to the duality that this sutra was, was really addressing. This became a way of instructing the reader that women were as capable of attaining awakening as were men. And remember that previous to the Mahayana, um, the many Nikaya groups were culturally bound and felt that women could not attain awakening as women, that they had to be transformed into men through subsequent rebirths in order to uh, be awakened. And this is stating emphatically, no, that's not the case. Women can be just as easily awakened as can men, or maybe easily as, as readily, easily is not the right term perhaps. And so that was a very important message to a patriarchal main, male dominated society, an important message in support of the role of women in Buddhism today. And I think that that's, one of the things about the Vimla Kirti Sutra that was really sort of mind bending. I mean, we think about fitting everybody into, a, you know, thousands of beings into something the size of a closet. On a very real level, the idea that a woman could be awakened as readily as a male was more mind boggling to the people at that time than fitting a lot of folks inside a, inside a room the size of a closet. Next, please. <clears throat> So what is the major theme of the chapter? Thereupon, a certain goddess who lived in that house, having heard this teaching of the Dharma, we're now going back before the portion we just looked at. Um, having heard this teaching of the Dharma of the great heroic bodhisattvas and being delighted, pleased, and overjoyed, manifested herself in a material body and showered the great spiritual heroes, the bodhisattvas and great disciples, with heavenly flowers. And by great disciples, we're talking about um, Shariputra, Mahamogliana, all of the, the disciples, 100 disciples or more that we know about, that we have histories about. And they showered them with heavenly flowers. And when the flowers fell on the bodies of the bodhisattvas, they fell off on the floor. But when they fell on the bodies of the great disciples, they stuck to them and they did not fall. The great disciples, and here I'm quoting from, from the sutra, the great disciples shook the flowers and even tried to use their magical powers, but still the flowers would not shake off. Then the goddess said to the venerable Shariputra, Reverend Shariputra, why do you shake these flowers? Yeah. Shariputra replied, goddess, these flowers are not proper for religious persons, and so we're trying to shake them off. The goddess said, do not say that, Reverend Shariputra, why? These flowers are proper indeed. Why? Such flowers have no such distinctions, thought nor discrimination. But the elder Shariputra has distinctions, thought and discrimination. Reverend Shariputra impro improperly, impropriety for one who has renounced the world for the disciple of the rightly taught Dharma consists of distinctions, thoughts and discrimination. Yet the elders are full of such thoughts. One who is without such thoughts is always proper. Reverend Shariputra, see how these flowers do not stick to the bodies of these great spiritual heroes, the bodhisattvas. This is because they have eliminated distinctions, thoughts, and discriminations. Shariputra is upset by what he perceived as a violation of the Maya, namely, and this is not a quote, this is uh, my uh, interpretation. Shariputra is upset by what he perceived as a violation of the Vinaya, namely using adornments, and attempts to use his powers to shed the unwelcome decoration, but to no avail. A battle of wits and wisdom then ensues, in which Shariputra is sorely bested and humiliated by the goddess. She explains that he cannot shake off the flowers because he is attached, for instance, to a formalistic and superficial understanding 
of the Dharma and the Vinaya. This speaks to the broader issue of our attachments and having a closed mind that cannot see beyond the superficial. Later in this section the chapter of the chapter, Shariputra asks the god, goddess, of the three vehicles, which do, you prefer, which do you pursue? The goddess replied, I use the law of the voice hearers to convert living beings, and therefore I practice the way of the voice hearer. I use the law of causes and conditions to convert living beings, and therefore I practice the way of the Pratitya Buddha. I use the law of great pity to convert living beings, and therefore I practice the great vehicle. In other words, to me, the major themes of the chapter really have to do, number one, with attachment, the attachment that we have to our ideas, whatever those ideas may be, and also the idea that this chapter is purporting not to be pejorative toward the Shravakas, but to say that they're a middling capacity. In other words, they they understand things in relation to the context of the world they live in at that time. Uh, that's why we see the flowers not falling off of them. They look at the Vinay and they say, Vinay says not to have decorations, as opposed to really questioning, well, where did these decorations come from? They're heavenly flowers. They're not really decorations. They're more of a kind of offering. In other words, how do we re-understand this information? But additionally, in this chapter, we're, we're going back to the how does the bodhisattvas regard sentient beings is the idea of, number one, as is found in all these chapters, non-duality, the emptiness of perception, that we perceive things and we think that that's the nature of reality through our, through our senses. The nature of reality is beyond there. And the bodhisattva, by going beyond that perceptual understanding, better understands the nature of the suffering that is being, uh, uh, that other sentient beings are experiencing. In conclusion, as I've said in, this, the, this, in the past, the sutra has been very popular. It never had a school of Buddhism constructed around it like the Lotus or the Avatimsaka, but it has its attractions. First of all, it's humorous, and at times a bit irreverent. At the same time, it's filled with teachings that were elaborated in greater detail later, but it sets the stage for those teachings. Specifically, it purports that limiting delusion of the Sravakas, the ambivalence of the sexes, the advantage of the Mahayana over early Buddhism, the transcendental body of the Tathagata, the benevolent and saving power of the Bodhisattvas, and emptiness. Most emphatically, it asserts non-duality in the absolute. Finally, we as people on the Bodhisattva path should be open to ideas that seem impossible with our restricted perception and live a life dedicated to embracing nirvana and samsara as the same and different without hesitation. These are all lessons that are at the heart of the Mahayana teachings. The ideas in this sutra are easy to understand because they're in such an attractive